with a 21-gun salute. Then President Ali Khamenei was welcomed by General Zia in Pakistan in 1986. Zia also knew Saddam Hussein wanted the bomb for Iraq. David Albright served as a weapons inspector in Iraq and now is the president of ISIS, the Institute for Science and International Security. During the Iran-Iraq war, they understood that Iraq was seeking nuclear weapons. And? The Khan network provided Iran with a starter kit so they could start their centrifuge program. AQ Khan's network started meeting up with Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and nuclear program officials in about 1987, maybe a little bit earlier. Mark Fitzpatrick directs the non-proliferation program at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. So Iranians uh, talked with Khan. Khan said, uh, I, I am, uh, weapons are us. I can give you everything for a nuclear weapons program. He had suppliers around the world, Switzerland, South Africa, Germany. Oli Heinonen retired last year as the world's top nuclear cop after spending 27 years with the International Atomic Energy Agency, or IAEA, in Vienna. He personally investigated just what Khan sold to the Iranians for $10 million. He provided them with the centrifuges. He provided some information how you turn high enriched uranium to uranium metal. A key piece of evidence was in a 15-page document. Iran's only answer an excuse is that, oh, how did that document get in there? Uh, that We must have gotten that by mistake. The only purpose for such kind of document is nuclear weapon development. No other use. And coming up, satellite photos reveal more of Iran's nuclear secrets. Now you see it, now you don't. And the mystery of a laptop computer full of nuclear documents and the spy who paid with his life. Don't go away. I'm an excellent driver. 1988. Rain Man was number one at the box office. Ronald Reagan was president. And in Pakistan, Dr. A.Q. Khan was building the bomb. He was also selling nuclear components and plans to Iran, as well as offering a shocking array of missile technology and weapons. Pakistan, under General Zia al Haq, was all too happy to encourage Khan's booming business with China and Iran. Zia continued to support A.Q. Khan to protect him from American and European pressure. But in August 1988, Zia died in a mysterious plane crash when his C-130 Hercules airplane went down in Pakistan. All 31 passengers and crew, which included American Ambassador Arnold L. Rafael, perished. Three months later, Benazir Bhutto, the daughter of Zulfikar, the man Zia hanged, was elected Pakistan's president. She also developed a relationship with Khan, even though publicly she often tried to make out that the army kept her well away from nuclear secrets. Khan thrived, and a nuclear Pakistan was born on the 28th of May, 1998, as five nuclear bombs were detonated. Khan was everywhere, selling and promoting technology. He put himself on this cover of his 1999 book on science and education. This appears to be some, some sort of lecture on nuclear fission, and there's a schematic of a uranium bomb. In Bulgaria, we showed the cover to scientist Ivanka Barzashka, who worked at the Strategic Security Program at the Federation of American Scientists. On the board here, you can see something about a uranium deuteride experiment. Under American pressure, Khan's black market was closed out officially after his arrest in 2004. Here's his confession on Pakistan National TV. I take full responsibility for my actions and seek your pardon. The next day, he was pardoned by then-President Pervez Musharraf and sentenced to house arrest. These are Fox News exclusive photographs of Khan and his wife, Dutch-born Hedrina. This one, under house arrest. And here are other never-before-seen documents, including Khan's written confession, which is specific about Iran. Later, there was a lot of pressure to give some centrifuge parts and drawings, etc., to the Iranians. These documents are confirmation 
that Iran is developing a bomb. Khan's early benefactors, Zulfikar Bhutto and Zia, both met early deaths, and Bhutto's daughter, Benazir, was assassinated in December 2007. It was his fear that something like that would happen to him, which caused him to write the darling letter. Tell them the bastards first used us and are now playing dirty games with us. This is just to forewarn you. It's surprising to me that uh, A.Q. Khan is still alive. They could have killed him a long time ago. Is A.Q. Khan still in business? I don't think Khan is uh, in business of proliferating anymore. The question is, are members of his extended network uh, still involved in any black market uh, nuclear business? Khan declined Fox News' request for an interview. He might be out of business, but his legacy lives on in Iran. This is the sprawling Lavazan army garrison. Here, Iran's suspected nuclear weapons program is headed by Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. He is a very dangerous player in this whole game. No known photograph of him exists. Fakhrizadeh is a high-ranking officer with the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and a senior scientist with the Ministry of Defense. The IEA has been seeking to interview him. Iran won't let him be interviewed. When Fox News asked to interview Fakhrizadeh, Iran responded in an email that, quote, Iran will not be in a position to reveal the names of its scientists as they have become target to terrorist actions and assassinations. The lobbies on site was suspected to be part of Iran's gas centrifuge program. When the Lavazan barracks caught the attention of the IAEA in 2003, something very strange began to happen. This is a satellite image of Lavazan from the year 2000. Paul Brannan is a senior analyst at ISIS. They essentially tore down the buildings at the site and scraped up the dirt. The Iranian government told the IAEA that the city of Tehran demanded the army give the land back for a soccer field and athletic center. The military nuclear effort in Iran is suspected to be housed here at FIDA. Take a look at this 2005 letter from Fakhrizadeh to Fadat department heads with his signature. This letter lists the kinds of departments you would have if you were putting together a nuclear weapons program. And so FIDAT remains of great interest to the IA and others. In 2004, Western intelligence got a huge break. It was reported that the BND, Germany's CIA, had an agent working inside Iran's nuclear program and got its hands on a laptop full of secrets. It was an Iranian working for Western intelligence? It was an Iranian agent. He got uh, captured. His wife had his laptop. She got out of the country. Her husband is obviously dead by now. The thousands of pages of laptop documents, what do they really show? They showed Iran designing a spherical object. It didn't say nuclear weapon, but it had all the attributes of a nuclear weapon, you know, designed to explode 600 meters above ground, which is what you would do for nuclear weapons. The role of Fakhrizadeh is pretty well described. Iran says the laptop documents are fakes, stating to Fox News, quote, the so-called laptop lacked authenticity. But various intelligence agencies have looked at the documentation and they've concluded, no, it's, uh, it's credible and it's consistent. When we come back, wanted in New York City but missing in China, who is Li Fang Wei? And exposed the secret relationship of some of the world's most prominent banks with Iran. Welcome back. I'm Bill Hemmer. Much of the world's commerce comes through Manhattan. Billions of dollars flow through New York banks every day by way of international transactions. But when those transactions violate international sanctions, that's a crime. And when banks help Iran pay for its nuclear shopping list, it takes on a whole different dimension. Here's senior correspondent Eric Sean. These steps should look familiar if you've ever seen an episode of Law and Order. This is the New York State Supreme Court building in Lower Manhattan, where legendary Manhattan District Attorney Robert Morgenthau prosecuted cases for 34 years. He and his investigative team define prosecution of international financial crimes, exposing Iran's buying spree 
in a market for suspected weapons of mass destruction. We're here today to discuss how to engage with Iran and to prevent it from becoming a nuclear armed nation. Senator, yes. I could emphasize one point, and that is, um, I mean, we have Iran's shopping list uh, for materials related to weapons of mass destruction. We take advantage of the fact that so much of the world's commerce flows through banks and institutions in Manhattan. Adam Kaufman is the Chief of Investigations for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. So there's a real place for the Manhattan District Attorney's Office to have a role in policing the world's markets as they come through Manhattan. Morgenthau, together with federal authorities, exposed how Iran secretly moves money to finance its pursuit of WMDs. He exposed a secret relationship between the Islamic Republic and some of the world's most prominent banks. It all started with an investigation into a little-known but powerful organization called the Alavi Foundation, which we reported on two years ago. Alavi is headquartered in this Fifth Avenue building on the 23rd floor. Alavi builds itself as a charitable effort to, quote, support interfaith harmony and promote Islamic culture and Persian language, literature, and civilization. There had been a lot of litigation claiming that the Alavi Foundation was under the control of the uh, government of Iran. So we started to dig and we were examining how it was moving money both into and out of the United States. What did you first find? What we found were a number of significant ties to the Iranian banking system, primarily with Bank Meli, which is an Iranian bank that has been designated as a supporter of terrorism by the United States government. Now, I'm not saying that we found evidence of terrorism with the Alavi Foundation, just a tie to that designated bank. But the investigation did reveal illegal transactions between Iran's Bank Meli and a major British financial institution, Lloyds Bank. Kaufman ran the Lloyds Pro. Lloyds offered banking services to Iranian banks. What he found was a scheme called stripping. What is stripping and how did it work? This is actually a SWIFT message. SWIFT is that international banking system. So this is a printout of the type of message that would be communicated between banks. What's important is the incoming part. That means it was incoming to Lloyd's. If you look at the top message from Bank Melly, it says, please do not mention our name to any bank in the United States. And they don't. So you're saying the bank employees were instructed to hide any evidence that this money came from Iran? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's against the law to, to cause those transfers to go through the United States and through U.S. banks, that's right. In what's called a deferred prosecution agreement, Lloyd's admitted that from 2001 to 2004, it altered records related to money transfers from Iranian banks. It paid $350 million in fines and forfeitures. Lloyd's declined our request for an interview, but responded, we have settled all investigations and are committed to running our business with the highest integrity. The bank Credit Suisse was next. Credit Suisse has agreed to pay $536 million in monetary penalties. Last year, Morgenthau retired, and Cyrus Vance Jr. took over as DA, pledging to continue the investigations into Iran. Soon, another bank was taking a stripping plate. Barclays Bank, to the tune of $298 million in fines and forfeitures. In a letter to Fox News, Barclays wrote, We believe the settlement speaks for itself. Barclays acknowledged and accepted responsibility for the historic conduct. So far, that is a total of more than $1 billion paid by banks for doing shady business with Iran. Sources tell Fox News that more bank cases are on the way. Why would some of the biggest banks in the world basically be engaged in illegal activity to help Iran? These Iranian banks are going to keep very substantial deposits with the banks at all times. So it's a huge source of net assets for the banks. Stopping the money means stopping any illegal trade. In June, Vance indicted the giant Iran shipping lines for shipments allegedly related to weapons of mass destruction. Meet Lee Fung Wei, a.k.a. Carl Lee, who also goes by at least five other names. A citizen of China, he is a wanted man in New York, accused of providing Iran with material that could be used for weapons of mass destruction. 
I would love to see Lee Fong Wei brought back to a courtroom in the state of New York to stand trial. Mr. Lee and his company, called Lim, were indicted on 118 counts in 2009. What would he be accused of? The crime that he was indicted for was 